One of the things that you take into the forest is an absolute awareness of your own frailty, weakness, and mortality. There are plants in the forest that will kill you. There are berries that if you eat one, you will die. Everything in the forest kills us. Confronting the forest is to confront our own mortality, is to confront our own frailty, our own weaknesses. That's the thing about a witch. Witches don't usually approach you and just say, hey, I'm a witch. They usually approach you as a, as a tender old grandmother who just wants to feed you. But what are they going to feed you? And whatever it is they're gonna feed you, I promise you, it's gonna look pretty. It's gonna look beautiful. It's gonna look attractive. But then what you actually are eating are going to be things like poison, human body parts. It's always gonna be something dark and ugly. But oh my goodness, thank goodness there's an old, there's a, there's a grandmother there. Does it really make sense to you that an old lady, an old, a sweet old woman would be able to live in the forest by herself? No, she must be dangerous. Because if you're gonna live among the dangerous things, you need to be dangerous yourself. And by the way, that's a life lesson. If you're going to live among dangerous things, you better be dangerous yourself to be able to protect yourself. And how you interact with me is gonna have everything to do with the dark forest of your soul. And how I interact with you is gonna have everything to do with the dark forest of my soul. You already know the story, man. Life is suffering. And we don't get to choose not to suffer, but we can, we can, we can choose what we're going to suffer for. And I added last week that we can also now choose how we're going to suffer. We're gonna suffer with resentment, and contempt, and anger, bitterness, hostility. Or are we gonna suffer with a, with a forthright soul that's gonna say, despite the darkness of the forest that's in me, despite the darkness of the forest that surround me, all the other people walking around. I'm going to choose to, to embrace life and say yes to life in all of its facets, with all of its sufferings, with all of its joys, with all of its contempts, with all of its misery, with all of its happiness, with all of its opportunities, the totality of all of it, that you can see that all of it is perfect and exactly as it should be. And that you would, you would not want it to be any other way. At that point, you can embrace life. And when you do that, there's nothing to be afraid of in the forest because you've already examined the dark parts of yourself and you know what's there and you know how to handle it. And then therefore you know what's in the dark parts of other people as well. You're gonna see that little old lady out in the forest for exactly what she is. And you're gonna see Shrek also and see him exactly for what he is. But perhaps most importantly, you're going to most importantly, you're gonna see yourself. And uh, you're gonna see yourself for exactly as you are. Maybe say yes to that. Like a forest has a, has a threshold. You guys know what I mean by, by thresholds? Like Why thresholds are that? really important. What's that? Like a certain vicinity. Kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a cutoff for a vicinity. So. The threshold for, for this room is the doorway. When you walk into the door, you cross a threshold into this room. When you walk out, you cross a threshold and you're back into the world. Thresholds are really important. We don't even really realize it because we encounter them so, you know, from such a young age, from so early on. And they're just such a part of us that they, they modify our behavior, they modify our thinking. Like for example, if you're walking down the street and you're talking with your friends and you make a left and you cross a threshold and you walk into a church, Suddenly now our mindsets change, our behavior changes, even the tone in which we talk changes. We turn around, we go back out, and we cross that threshold back into the, back into the common world. <clears throat> Think of it as, you know, you, you enter sacred spaces, and then you enter profane spaces. Profane doesn't mean profanity, it just means not sacred. Sacred spaces are places that kind of um, almost elicit, not quite, or even command, why not? They command a reverence, like a, a deep respect things around us. It's one of the, um, like you'll see this for example, there's a reason that when you go to a university that the buildings look the way that they do. They're supposed to look like like a university building. You're supposed to walk in there, you're supposed to feel differently when you walk through the threshold of that door. So when you enter a forest, there is at some point some threshold where the forest begins and then there's a threshold where the forest ends. And then when you enter the, uh, the area that, that, that where, the, where the forest begins, you start to encounter all of the things that we're talking about up here. Certainly going to encounter animals. You're going to encounter plants. That's true. 
But then there's also going to be all of those dark spaces in between those two things. And if you remember this, what inhabits the darkness is our imaginations. Our imaginations inhabit the darkness. What's in the darkness? Well, whatever you take with you, of course. Whatever, you know, what, what is it? You know, are there witches there? Are there monsters? Or are there just these, you know, these, uh, these uncertain paths? And if it's not certain, again, that's just like darkness on top of darkness. And so whatever it is that's in the forest is probably whatever we bring to it. You know, can you go through the forest and, and not get killed? Not in your imagination. But in reality, yes. In reality, yes. But in our imaginations, we're, we're dying constantly. What's going to kill us in the world? Well, everything, right? Cars, viruses, bombs, shooters. We're constantly walking around terrified, and yet here we are every day. We keep thinking the world's going to end. We have all these catastrophes that are always happening. The world's going to, right now, what, the, world, the climate is just changing. Before the, it was getting too hot, before that in the 70s, they thought it was getting too cold. And at some point, there were killer bees that were worried that were coming up from, from, from the southern hemisphere. There's always something that's gonna kill us, why? Because we don't really know what's going to happen. And when we don't know what's going to happen, we, we allow our imaginations to run wild. And what runs wild is typically the worst case scenario. And there's a value to that because it prepares you for the worst case scenario. But there's also a really detrimental effect, which is that it stops you from ever being able to enjoy your world. It stops you from ever being able to enjoy your life because you're always worried about the worst that happens. Then when the worst thing doesn't happen, it's like a relief. <sighs> But really, how often has the worst thing that could possibly happen ever happened to you? I can tell you right now, it never has, because everybody's still alive, everybody who's in here right now anyway. <coughs> the worst thing that can happen to you hasn't happened to you yet. It will, someday, sometime. But where is it going to happen? Is it going to happen in a forest? Is it going to happen on a street corner? Is it going to happen in your living room? Is it going to happen to you just going down to 7-Eleven? Who knows? And you can spend your whole life worrying about that. But it's that uncertainty that, 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 that really plays on us. When you go into a forest, you're not certain what's there, of course. And so we start to imagine that there are terrible things that are there. That's why fairy tales always take place there. Like the Grimm Brothers fairy tale. Do you guys know the point of the Grimm, of the Grimm Brothers fairy tales? To so, like, make people stay away from the forest? Kind of. Here's what it was. The Grimm Brothers were worried about Germany's, uh, Germany losing its culture. So they recorded these stories. They weren't for kids. They said they were fairy tales, they were for kids. Not really, they weren't. They were just supposed to be German stories. And they were told through the, through the, um, through the lens of, this, of a fairy tale. It has certain tropes, it has certain movements, it has certain expectations, plot devices. That's all it was. It wasn't supposed to be for children. But one of the ways that you could really convey your, your, your culture's culture is by fairy tales. The things that we, like, you know, the kinds of themes and things that we would teach to kids. Yeah. Cause I feel like um, a lot of fairy tales, cause, uh, when they take place in courses, because like, since we don't really know what's there, you can be more loose with it. Exactly. Exactly. We know what happens in the city. You, you walk, you know, you, and, and the, only, the only kind of really dangerous things that happen in the city in a story or at night, you know, wherever it is that you can't see, you can invent. And so, yeah, exactly. And, and that's also a value to it. You, it, uh, the story takes place in Gotham City. Where is Gotham City? It's in that one place. <laughs> yeah, it's not a real place. If, they, if you tell them, oh, it takes place in New York, it takes place in Los Angeles, it takes place in San Diego, then everything has to kind of comport to reality. You ever watch a TV show or watch a movie that takes place somewhere that you know? Like if it takes place in San Diego and you're like, that place isn't really there. That's not what it's really called. Yeah, you know, there's a, a TV show that... Is on, it's on uh, Netflix, it's called SWAT. I watch it from time to time. It takes place in Los Angeles. And one of the things that's neat about the story is that what they, the, the street names they talk about, not they're, all, they're actually where they say they're hap where it's happening. But then the storylines are so ridiculous. And, you say, and if, if it was happening in like some fictitious city, it would make more sense because you could, you could believe the unbelievable. And that's the value of things happening in a forest. It allows you to believe the unbelievable. Because how many of us have spent a lot of time in forests? Okay, so you don't know what happens there. Well, let me tell you what happens there. There are these two kids, Hansel and Gretel. There's this one ogre, his name is Shrek. Yeah. If you've never spent time in forests, then it's, it becomes believable because you can play loose with the truth. 
because, I mean, who, who among us knows any better? And so our soul is a dark forest in all the ways that you guys are talking about. What inhabits your, your soul? We've already talked about that. Monsters, witches. What inhabits the closet when, you, when you're a little kid? The, the monsters that you imagine being there. That means that the monsters are not actually in the closet. The monsters are inside of you. You're projecting into the darkness the things that are inside of your own soul. And then that's the terrible thing about a forest because now you have to confront your own soul. You have to walk through it. What's out there? Real dangers? Yeah, but also metaphysical dangers. The metaphysical dangers that inhabit your mind. Things that you take with you into the forest. Those doubts, those fears, those concerns. One of the things that you take into the forest is an absolute awareness of your own frailty, weakness, and mortality. Because you, rec because you recognize intuitively there are plants there are plants in the forest that will kill you. There are berries that if you eat one, you will die. Everything in the forest kills us. That's one of the reasons we don't live in the forests. And so confronting the forest is to confront our own mortality, is to confront our own frailty, our own weaknesses. And so what does that look like? It looks like whatever it is that you take to it. Monsters, something supernatural. Witches, things that are also supernatural but seem to be friendly. That's the thing about a witch. Witches don't usually approach you and just say, hey, I'm a witch. They usually confront, they usually approach you as a, as a tender old grandmother who just wants to feed you. But what are they going to feed you? And whatever it is they're gonna feed you, I promise you, it's gonna look pretty. It's gonna look beautiful. It's gonna look attractive. But then what you actually are eating are going to be things like poison, human body parts, it's always gonna be something dark and ugly. Because that's the thing, a lot of times things look attractive. And that's what, it, and that's what attracts us to it. And so we find some sense of a, of a shelter almost in this unknown danger of the forest. This thing is terrifying to us. But oh my goodness, thank goodness there's an old, there's a, there's a grandmother there. Does it really make sense to you that an old lady, an old, a sweet old woman would be able to live in the forest by herself? No, she must be dangerous. Because if you're going to live among the dangerous things, you need to be dangerous yourself. And by the way, that's a life lesson. If you're going to live among dangerous things, you better be dangerous yourself to be able to protect yourself. So if you find yourself in a dangerous environment and there's a little old lady, oh, hi, how are you? You know she has a gun. Because she wouldn't be there otherwise. She has to be more, at least as dangerous, if not more dangerous than her surroundings. And yet we'll, we'll, we'll encounter them and just be kind of like, Oh, thank goodness I found you. Oh, yeah. Thank goodness you found me. Come on in. Come on in. And then because we're seeking shelter in this dangerous place, we're totally willing to follow her. And so we do, and our situation goes from bad to catastrophic. It goes from hypothetically terrible to, to, to terrible in reality. Because now we've entered a threshold of that person's house. Now they're in complete control. We don't get to leave when we want. We think we do because the door is there, but... The door is shut, man. The door is locked. And even if you could will yourself to, it's that will to be taken, it's that desire, sorry. It's that desire to be taken care of and protected and feel like we're safe that overwhelms that will to live. And so we go along with the old lady and this is why in the fairy tales, the kids usually get away because there's lots of kids who don't. The stories are about the ones who actually made it because they're the exception. They're the surprising part of the story. They actually survived it. Yeah. I'm not trying to really connect this to anything, but like all the brothers' grim stories, it reminds me of like how much like modern like retellings like try to water down everything, like make it more like I guess commercial. I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because it's scary and bad. What's wrong with being scary? Okay. But I, I just know like, like these days, like Disney retellings are like more popular than like the original stories it comes from. And like mm -hmm. it's, the Disney ones get more known than the actual story behind it. Remember that, that's a, it is a real question. Like I wonder about that. Like we are not supposed to scare kids, but when you come to school, we'll fill your heads with all kinds of news and things that are supposed to terrify you. You know the world's gonna end in like 10 years unless we stop driving cars right now? 
what? Oh my God, yeah, we're all gonna die. You tell little kids things like that. Of course, that's an exaggerated version of it, but you tell little kids things like that, you don't think they grow up in terror and fear? You know, any second, any second, someone could come through that door with a gun and kill us all. That happens often, right? We hear about it all the time because it's the rarity. In other words, our news is constantly filling you guys with things to be afraid of. You know, there's a virus that like kills like 99.999% of people that contract it. Sorry, I had that wrong. It actually doesn't kill. Actually, the survival rate is over 99%. Sorry, I had that backwards. But we won't, worry, we won't worry you with the details of it all. We'll just tell you to stay home and put on masks. We're constantly filling your heads with things that are gonna kill you off. But then at the same time we say, but we shouldn't scare people. Isn't that exactly what we're doing constantly? So no, you're not wrong about that at all. It's just a, it's an interesting paradox. And right? we can't tell the, the grim stories the way they were really actually written because you know, it's, we don't wanna scare kids. Well, scaring kids is for school, that's not for movies. So, yeah. <clears throat> Forest is dark, everything there kills us, and we have to be careful what we do with her. Now the same is gonna be true of our souls. So the soul is a dark forest, but the trees that, that, that inhabit that forest, well, they're a particular species, they're, they're genealogical trees. Yes, it is family, but it's not, it's not just families, it's everybody else's family as well. In other words, the, the, the trees that make up your soul, it's not just the people who came before you in your own life, but when you inhabit, okay, when you when you encounter another person, you're encountering all their genealogical forests as well. I mean, if you look around this room right now, there's probably 35 of us in here, I'm guessing. 36 of us in here. And that's 36 forests, 36 darknesses, 36 genealogical forests that are all coming together and interacting. And how you interact with me is gonna have everything to do with the dark forest of your soul. And how I interact with you is gonna have everything to do with the dark forest of my soul. This is why, and it always, it always makes people angry for some, well, no, I shouldn't say for some reason, like I don't know, I know why, but it's, that doesn't mean it's not true. I'll oftentimes say, I don't need to meet parents, man. I've met you guys. I don't need to ask your parents what's important to them. I already know when I interact with you. And people often say, ah, oh, that's not true. I'm so different from my parents. No, no, you're, you're, you're an amalgamation of, of a person's who's trying to figure yourself out through the lens of what, you, of what you've you know, been taught as you were growing up. And there's some aspects of you that'll be independent, but even the parts of you that, are, that, that you think are independent, they're really not. It's just, rather than following the trend of what our families have taught us, now we're following the trends of what society tells us we're supposed to be interested in. The rare individual is the one who can emerge from all that influence to be truly and solidly themselves, which is hard. It takes commitment to be able to, to do that. First off, you have to recognize that this is what you are. And then you have to, to want to be something else. Because as we know, wanting to be something else, as we've said, is going to cost you. Of course, you already know the story, man. Life is suffering. And we don't get to choose not to suffer, but we can, we can, we can choose what we're going to suffer for. And I added last week that we can also now choose how we're going to suffer. Are we gonna suffer with resentment and contempt and anger, bitterness, hostility? Or are we gonna suffer with a, with a forthright soul that's gonna say, despite the darkness of the forest that's in me, despite the darkness of the forest that's surround me, all the other people walking around, I'm going to choose to, to embrace life and say yes to life in all of its facets, with all of its sufferings, with all of its joys, with all of its contempts with all of its misery, with all of its happiness, with all of its opportunities, the totality of all of it, that you can see that all of it is perfect and exactly as it should be. And that you would, you would not want it to be any other way. At that point, you can embrace life. And when you do that, there's nothing to be afraid of in the forest because you've already examined the dark parts of yourself and you know what's there and you know how to handle it. And then therefore you know what's in the dark hearts of other people as well. You're gonna see that little old lady out in the forest for exactly what she is. And you're gonna see Shrek also and see him exactly for what he is. But perhaps most importantly, you're going to, you know, 
Most importantly, you're gonna see yourself. And you're gonna see yourself for exactly as you are. Maybe say yes to that. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques? Happy Monday.